And now if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke again today, picking up where we left off today in our study of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we come once again to verse 23 of Luke chapter 9, and uh, I'll be reading that and down to verse 27. So Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come today to your word and we would reverently approach your word knowing that it is so um, important when we think about the issues that are at stake. And Father, we want to understand the words of Christ. We don't want to just blow by them or to develop unfounded opinions about them, but we desire that you would instruct us and teach us and give us understanding from your word, by your Holy Spirit. Not only that, that you would give us hearts that believe your word and embrace your word and obey your word. For you are worthy of our trust. You're worthy of our love. You are worthy of our obedience. And so please come and help us, both preacher and hearer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, as we return today to our study of the Gospel of Luke, if you were here last week, you will recognize again that we're returning to a passage that we began to look at uh, last week. And I just remind you very briefly of the context up in verse 20, Peter, speaking for himself and the other apostles, has just made his great confession of Jesus as the Christ of God. So Peter and the apostles, as they've observed our Lord and they've heard his teaching, they've seen his miracles and the things that he has done, they have come to understand and to see and to know that Jesus is the Christ. But immediately Jesus warns them and commands them to tell this to no one. And then he begins to speak about the necessity of his approaching sufferings and death and his resurrection on the third day. And so in verse 21, immediately after make, uh, Peter makes his great confession, we read, and he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. You see, before the disciples could properly proclaim his person, First, they must understand the nature of his work or what he has come to do. His messiahship was not to issue into immediate glory on earth, but into suffering and shameful death. There is no salvation. There is no kingdom apart from the cross. Now, it was shocking for these disciples to hear this. This is not what they, uh, they were expecting. But as hard as it was for the disciples at this point to fully understand this, in our passage today, Jesus follows by saying something else that cut across the grain of common misconceptions about the Messiah and about what it meant, what it means to be one of his people. He begins to tell them that just as he must deny himself and suffer, if you desire to come after me and to follow me, that in principle and spirit, you must be prepared to do the same. 
It's not about health and wealth and your best life now. It's not all about power and worldly prosperity and self-enhancement and self-gratification. No, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So in verse 23, Jesus lays out before us what it means to be his disciple. What is involved in being a Christian? It involves denying self, taking up the cross, and following him. Now as we come back to, to this today, <clears throat> I want to underscore again that this is not some obscure passage, that this is really the heart, this is the core of what Jesus taught about what it means to be a true Christian. What it means by spirit-given faith in him to repent and to follow him as his disciples. And, uh, disciple, and this is all over uh, the gospel records. He keeps repeating this sometimes in different language, but it's the same principle. Let me just give you some examples. Let's look at some examples. Turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 10, for example. We're going to turn to a couple of passages. Matthew 10 Verse 34. Now, in the context, Jesus has been talking about confessing him before men, confessing allegiance to Christ as your Savior and Lord. And he says in verses 32 to 33, those who confess me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And then picking up with verse 34. Jesus says something that might be shocking to us. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And Jesus is saying, listen. If you confess allegiance to me and follow me, it may cost you something, even in your own family. It may make things in your family relationships worse, not better. Because of their unbelief or even hostility to the gospel, you may experience a tremendous rift between you and your dearest relations. But that's a price that you must be willing to pay if you're going to be my disciple and then he says, verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then he, and then he follows with words very similar, same, same principle as in our text in Luke chapter 9. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. It's the same call to self-denying, cross-bearing trust and devotion to Jesus Christ. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 14. Now this is the same gospel of Luke. This, uh, in the same gospel of Luke, it's just something Jesus said on a later occasion. Picking up at verse 25 of Luke chapter 14. We read, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them. So this is the setting. There are multitudes, huge crowds of people who are following Jesus as he moves along. And so he's going along, and now he, he stops suddenly, and he turns to them, and he says something to these, these multitudes that are following him. But now what does he say? What does he say? Well, well, we might think he would say, you know, this is wonderful. It's so glad to have all of you here. Uh, such a wonderful thing to be so popular with everyone. Or the average uh, American preacher today might say, wow, we're having a revival. Come on, let's get all these people baptized. But no, what did Jesus say to these people? Verse 26, if anyone comes to me, if you really want to come to me, if you really want to be saved by me, 
mean, you can just imagine, I, I, when I imagine this, I don't know what was going on in our Lord's mind, but I imagine that he's walking along and he's thinking about all of these people who are crowding around him. They've all been stirred because of the miracles that he's performed and the things that have happened, and, and they're all following him around, and, and this is bothering him. I don't mean that he, he doesn't like the people, but he's, he knows that these people are not following him for the right reasons, right? And so he stops and he turns around and he speaks to them. If you really want to come to me, you really want to be saved by me, to follow me, know this. Verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. You know, that doesn't seem like the way to, uh, you know, to, you know, uh, have your church growth movement, right? That's not a way to grow your church. <clears throat> These are strong words, aren't they? Now, they're not to be interpreted in a way that contradicts the teaching of Scripture as a whole. The fifth commandment commands us to honor our fathers and mothers, and the Scriptures teach that we are to love our brothers and sisters and our children, and so on. But what Jesus is underscoring here in the strongest possible terms is that to be, truly be his disciple, we must be prepared to follow him with a devotion that is greater than our devotion to even our nearest and dearest relations, and even more important to us than our own lives in this world. That whenever the claims of even our dearest relatives and friends or a concern for our own personal safety come into conflict with the claims of Jesus Christ, Christ must have the highest claim upon our allegiance. <clears throat> In other words, he's saying to these people, listen. Listen, folks. This is not all about, I know you, you know, fed to 5,000, but this is not all about getting bread. That's not what this is really about. This is not just all about having all of your wildest dreams come true and all of your diseases healed and overthrowing the Romans. It's not about wealth and health and prosperity with some fire insurance thrown in the deal as well. No, it's about being saved from your self-righteousness and from your sin and self-will as well as the hell to which it leads to become a believing, loyal, devoted disciple of me. Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, and again, it's the same emphasis we see in our opening text, verse 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, I want you to notice what follows, picking up in verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and ask conditions of peace. Now, what's Jesus doing here in these illustrations? He's exhorting them and he's exhorting us to count the cost, that there is a cost involved in becoming a Christian. And it's the failure to count the cost that has resulted in scores of professing Christians who in the end never pan out. After a while, after the initial excitement is worn off, they fall away. Why did it happen? Here's one of the reasons. They never counted the cost. Now, ultimately, of course, they were unregenerate and unbelieving. That's the first explanation. But what caused them to profess a faith in Christ that they never really had? It was the fact that they never understood what it really means to be a Christian. They were believing in Christ for something, perhaps, but they were not believing in Christ for the actual salvation that he offers and that he gives. They thought they could tag a little Jesus onto their lives as a fire insurance to keep them from hell or to just give them a little sentimental comfort when times are hard and they could then go on and live as they please. They never came to Christ to save them 
from their wretched, sinful, God-dishonoring, self-governing selves. No, they intended to keep that, not to be saved from it. And therefore, like the shallow soil, in our Lord's parable of the sower, they seem to believe for a while until temptation or difficulty comes, and then they fall away. Jesus says you must count the cost. You need to count the cost. And what's the cost? Verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. In other words, what Jesus is telling us is that a man cannot be a true disciple of Jesus Christ unless he is prepared, if necessary, to give up everything and anything that stands between you and devotion to him. You must be willing to forsake anything that is keeping you from placing yourself and all that you are and all that you will ever be entirely at his disposal. You see, salvation is free. Christ and the salvation he gives are freely extended to us, freely given to us in the gospel. We don't have to earn it or deserve it. We receive Christ as our Savior and Lord and the salvation that he gives with the empty hand of faith. But in doing so, we also need to understand what exactly this salvation is that we are receiving. It's not salvation to sin. It's salvation from sin. It's not merely a get out of hell free card. It's a salvation that brings us into a spiritual union with Jesus Christ that radically reorients our lives. A salvation that dethrones self and exalts Christ and gives us a heart that loves him and desires to live for him and to glorify him and to obey him and to follow him wherever he leads in a life that will sometimes expose us to ridicule and reproach and even the persecution of a sinful world. And Jesus was concerned to make that clear to people. See, he wasn't like the the army recruiter down at the recruiting office. You know, the kind of recruiter who only talks about the pay and and the nice handsome uniform that you'll get to wear that will impress all the girls and, and the pension plan and the travel opportunities and the glory, but he never talks about the stress of boot camp and the drills and the long marches and the battle and the enemy. He tries to hide all of that. That's the way some preachers are. It's like they're trying to trick people into becoming Christians. Just tries to hide all of that. But Jesus is not like... Uh, that, that recruiter down at the army recruiting office. He doesn't do that. And we mustn't either. Well, let's turn back now to our text. Luke chapter 9. Verse 23. I just go over these passages to help you to see that this is not just some little obscure text. That Jesus continually emphasizes this throughout his ministry. And I just, we just look at some of the texts. We could have looked at others. So Jesus is laying out for us the cost of discipleship, what is involved in being a Christian and living the Christian life. First, we have the call to discipleship in verse 23, and this is then followed by various motives and reasons for accepting and embracing that call. You'll see all these sentences that start with four, verse 25, four, verse uh, four, verse 24, four, verse 25, four, verse 26. He's giving reasons and motives. So let's look, first of all, at the call to discipleship, and and, uh, that's as far as we're going to get. You say, well, I thought we looked at that last week. We're going to look at it again. That's as far as we got last week, as far as we're going to get this week, okay? Uh, I I want to come back to it, and I want to look at it a little more carefully, because my concern, brothers and sisters, is that you really understand what Jesus is saying. I don't want to to unnecessarily upset uh, the the, the, uh, timid sheep of the flock by you misunderstanding what Jesus says, and others of you who maybe you have some kind of a false sense of security, I want to make sure you understand what Jesus says. That's the whole point of preaching, isn't it? I hope you believe that's the whole point of preaching. It's not just for me to stand up here and say a lot of interesting, exciting things and pump everybody up. It's to to help us to understand what God's Word is actually saying to us, right? 
So I wanted to come back to this. <clears throat> Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me. So what's envisioned here is a person who is desiring to come to Christ. To attach himself to Christ as his disciple, as one of his. Let me paraphrase J.C. Ryle describing this state of mind. <clears throat> Let's imagine a person who's been caused to consider the gospel. And he feels drawn and inclined to become a Christian. He's been awakened in some measure, perhaps by some affliction, by some awakening sermon or someone who's shared the gospel with him or some other means. His conscience has been stirred. He's been made to feel the value of his soul and he desires to be a Christian. Well, there's everything in the gospel to encourage him. All of his sins may be freely forgiven, no matter how many or how great. His heart may be completely changed and renewed, no matter how hard or how cold. Christ and the Holy Spirit and newness of life and forgiveness and grace and mercy and eternal life and all of the benefits of salvation are all ready for him and freely extended to him in Jesus Christ. Christ and all the salvation that is in him is put right before him in the gospel with the promise the whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. Yes. Yes. But he should also count the cost. He should understand what this receiving of Christ involves. And all that following him implies if you come to Christ for all of these benefits and all of this salvation that he gives, there is something that you must be willing to leave behind, self. And there is something that you must be prepared to endure, the cross. And there is a way of life to which it issues, the way of following Jesus. Let me repeat that. If you come to Christ as he's freely offered in the gospel to save us, and for all the benefits, for all of this salvation that he gives to sinners, there is something that you must be willing to leave behind, self. There is something that you must be prepared to endure, the cross, and there is a way of life to which it issues, the way of following Jesus. So let's look at these three imperatives. Three commands. First of all, Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Now, we, you, you'll remember we looked at this first imperative last week, but I want to say a few more things about it because I think it's important, first of all, that we are clear on what this doesn't mean, okay? <clears throat> what it doesn't mean. First of all, to deny yourself does not mean to deny your own distinct and unique identity and personality as a human being. That's not what it means. In Psalm 139, David celebrates the wonder of God's creative work in, in shaping him and forming him even from his mother's womb as a unique individual. And indeed, my friend, God gave you your gender, he gave you the color of your skin, the, the color of your eyes, your hair, your intelligence, your unique aptitudes and talents and gifts, and, and none of us are exactly the same, and that's not a part of sinnerhood, that's a part of creaturehood. God did that on purpose. God intended it that way. All of this diversity is a beautiful thing. So denying self does not mean eradicating your personality and your gifts and your talents. It doesn't mean becoming absorbed into some kind of cookie-cutter, stereotyped, zombie-like religious cult in which everyone looks the same, wears their hair the same, eats the same, dresses the same, and so on. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Secondly, denying yourself does not mean renouncing the ordinary and innocent enjoyments of life. In other words, the gospel is not about asceticism. 
Now, the gospel does encourage moderation in the use and enjoyment of created things, but not the denying of them. It doesn't teach that enjoying the good things that God has made or that God gives to us is sin or that it's somehow less holy to do so. Jesus never taught that. In fact, Jesus was criticized by the Pharisees. Uh, They called him a drunk and a gluttonous man. Now, of course, that wasn't true. He wasn't a drunk or a glutton, but they accused him of this because he didn't buy in to their ascetic false self-righteousness. Quoting Voss, the general tone of his life, notwithstanding its deep character, was not one of gloom, but of joy. You remember back in chapter 5 how they criticized Jesus and his disciples because they ate and drank And they didn't fast like the Pharisees did. And you remember how Jesus defended their right to be joyful. As the bridegroom was with them, the bridegroom has come now himself. Now, he didn't deny that there is a time to fast. He acknowledged that there is. But he underscored that the predominant characteristic of this gospel age for his people is joy. And the gospel does not forbid celebration. It doesn't forbid the enjoyment of a good meal and the good gifts of this life that God has given to us. Before the Pharisees, true religion was somber and gloomy and joyless. And the more holy a man was, the longer his face is. The more holy a man was, the more he denied himself, the enjoyment of created things. Now, this ascetic approach to religion and this misunderstanding of true godliness is still around today. We see it in false religions. It's, it's usually a mark of false religions, almost all of them. You see it in Buddhism, you see it in Islam. And many people in the world today think that this is what religion is all about. It's about rules and regulations. It's about giving up things you enjoy, even wholesome, legitimate things, and doing things that you don't like. And the more you don't like them, the more holy it is to go ahead and do them, right? That's pretty much what religion is. And then they carry that over to their understanding of what Christianity is. Never eat pork. Fish is only permitted on Friday for one entire month of the year. You must give up just about everything that is pleasurable and eat no meat. This is the kind of stuff that religion is made of. Actually, brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul calls this kind of teaching, teaching that tells people that this is the way to be right with God or this is the way to be truly holy. He calls it the doctrine of demons. 1 Timothy 4.1. He warns about giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And he talks about this in Colossians chapter 2. Such things have a show of righteousness, but it's not true righteousness. And they're of no value to the mortifying of the flesh, that is our sinful nature. We see this in the whole monastic movement of the Roman Catholic Church. We see it in the requirement of celibacy for the priest, vows of poverty and chastity for monks and nuns, those who want to be super godly. One thinks of Martin Luther before he came to a true understanding of the gospel. He thought true religion meant fasting more, wearing a hair shirt. He actually wore, you know that they do that, right? He wore a hair shirt. Why would he want to do that? To deliberately irritate his skin and to cause pain in order, as he thought, to mortify his flesh, flagellating himself with a whip, going to the priest every day to confess his sins, and doing acts of penance to try to make up for his sins. This was true religion, he thought. This was Christianity, he thought. But after he had done this for some time, he he was still no better. He could still find no power over his sins, no peace with God. He was still just as uncertain and even more uncertain about his relationship to God until finally he was brought by God's grace to a proper understanding of the gospel. So this is the spirit, you see, of Pharisaic religion. And this, listen, this is what the devil wants people to believe about Christianity. You're here today, a young person or adult, unsaved young person or adult here this morning. He wants you to think that being a Christian will make you miserable. If I follow Christ, I'll never be happy. 
No joy, no laughter, no enjoyment of the good things of this life. To follow Christ, to be a saved person, is to be doomed to a somber, bleak, unsmiling existence. But that's a lie. That's not biblical Christianity at all. And that is not what Jesus is talking about. That is not gospel self-denial. So this self-denial that Jesus calls us to in our text is not the denial of your own distinct and unique identity and personality as a human being. It's not uh, the denial of the ordinary, innocent enjoyments of life. Or another way of saying is this. The self-denial Jesus calls us to, okay, it is not denying what we are by creation as creatures created in the image of God. It's not the denial of that or the denial of what God has made for man's good and enjoyment in the creation. It's not that. Food, friendship, art, music, the beauty of the world around us. Christ did not come to destroy those things. He came to redeem them. It's not what we are by creation. It's what we are by the fall that we must be willing to deny and repudiate. And that leads me now to what this self-denial does mean, okay? Now, we've already considered this in detail last week. But let me review. I'm going to preach parts of the same sermon again, okay? But a little bit differently. You remember how we wrote this down last week? I'm, if I'm coming to Christ... And trust in him alone for salvation from sin and reconciliation with God and eternal life. This implies and involves the repudiation of the opposite of that. Obviously, right? It's not that I deny myself this, that, or the other. And after I've done that long enough, God will save me. Or because I've done that well enough, God will reward me with salvation. No, listen, it's in the very act of coming to Christ to trust him alone for salvation and acceptance. In the very act of trusting him for the kind of salvation that he gives, there is a repudiation of self. Or what the Bible calls elsewhere, repentance. Repentance and faith cannot be separated from one of their two sides of the same coin. And there is no coming to Christ for the salvation he gives separate from this self-repudiation. And this is so, as we saw last week, in three interrelated ways. I'm not talking about these are three steps or anything, but if you take this, this self-repudiation and look at it from different angles, it involves these three things, okay? Let me remind us of this. First, coming to Christ, being converted, involves denying self-righteousness as the basis of your hope of acceptance with God, the denial of righteous self. The Christian looks to no righteousness of his own. He, he trusts only in Christ and his shed blood and righteousness as the ground of his forgiveness and acceptance with God. Salvation in Christ is not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's a free gift of God's grace to those who don't deserve it and who deserve just the opposite. And listen, it must be received in that way. It must be received in that way. So righteous self must be repudiated as the basis of your hope if you desire to come after Christ. And let me just say that I am convinced that this is the most difficult self-denial of all. The very thing that keeps people from ever becoming true Christians more than anything else. Someone has said, sin has slain its thousands, but self-righteousness has slain its tens of thousands. In our natural pride, we want to bring something of our own as at least a part of the reason why God should accept us. What about my Bible reading, my church attendance, my religious heritage and background? The fact that I go to Mass and drop money in the offering plate. Or what about the fact that I pay my bills on time and unlike many other people, I work hard to provide for my family. 
Or what about my sweet attitude in taking cookies to my sick neighbor down the street? Or what about those tears that, that I shed when I watched the Passion movie? <laughs> sure, that counts for something. To give up all trust in your own morality and good deeds and good feelings and to trust in nothing but Jesus Christ alone for acceptance with God. That is very hard to many people, all people really, because of the native pride of the human heart. James Hervey was to be one of the great preachers of the 18th century, that whole host of great preachers during the evangelical revival in the 18th century. James Hervey was one of them in England. But as it was with a number of others at that time, like Wesley and even Whitfield and uh, Daniel Rowland and many of those men, when Hervey first entered the ministry, he himself was still unconverted. He was still trusting in his own works, his own efforts to be holy, and he struggled for a number of years not understanding the gospel. And there's an interesting story of something that happened in one of the parishes where he preached before his conversion. There was a plowman who lived nearby, and Hervey went to visit him, and he would follow him in the fields for exercise, and for his health. Well, in God's kind providence, this man was a true Christian. And Herbie asked him one morning, what do you think? You know, he's, he's kind of coming at this from the superior position. You know, I'm going to kind of catechize this guy, grill this guy a little bit. He said, what do you think is the hardest thing in religion? And the plowman replied, sir, I am a poor man and you are a minister. I beg leave to return the question. Then Hervey said, I think the hardest thing is to deny sinful self. And then he went on to give an elaborate argument for the point that he wanted to make. The plowman then replied, perhaps sensing what was the true problem with this proud young pastor. He said, sir, there is another instance of self-denial which is the hardest thing in religion. And that is to deny righteous self but it is absolutely necessary. Hervey says that at that time he hated such teaching and I thought him an old fool. I have since clearly seen who was the fool, not the wise old plowman, but the proud James Hervey. To be a Christian, you must deny righteous self. Secondly, coming to Christ does involve denying sinful self as well, in this sense, denying self's determined attachment to sin. Now again, as I said last week, this is not to say that, that you must break every chain of sin that binds you before you come to Christ and trust Him to save you. No, it's the work of the Savior to break the chains of sin. He's the one who does the saving, right? That's why you need a Savior. It's not that you've got to clean yourself up and get everything in order before you're warranted to come to Christ. No, just as the hymn says, just as I am, without one plea, O Lamb of God, I come. But you certainly can't be coming to Christ to save you from the chains of sin that bind you if you're not willing to be saved from them and you're still determined to cling to your darling sins. You can't do that. The two don't go to it. Just like I can't leave Coconut Creek to drive to Miami. I can't drive to Miami without leaving Coconut Creek. You can't do that. The two go together. That's why coming to Christ cannot be separated from renouncing natural self's determined attachment to sin. Christ is willing to receive any sinner, but he will not receive you if you're determined to stick to your sins. And then thirdly, again, as we saw last week, if you would come after Christ, you must deny ruling self. Righteous self, sinful self, and ruling self. In other words, it involves denying your right to govern your own life. I come to Christ to be saved from the guilt and punishment and dominion of sin over my life and to be restored to a right relationship with God. But what is the very essence of sin? 
that has caused me to have a broken relationship with God. What's the very essence of sin? It's the determination to be my own God and to govern my own life. And therefore, there's no coming to Christ for salvation if you're not willing to renounce self-rule. And that's why there's no separating of Christ as Savior from Christ as Lord. You can't accept part of him and, and reject another part of him because the salvation that he gives is a salvation that includes salvation from self-rule. And this is what it means then to deny yourself. Repudiating. Repudiate, and this meets us right at the beginning of the Christian life. Remember this, as I pointed out last week, this is an aorist imperative. Jesus is talking about a decisive, foundational repudiation of self. Repudiating self-righteous, sinful, self-governing self. And entrusting myself and all that I am, my salvation from now into eternity into the hands of Jesus Christ. It meets us right at the very beginning of the Christian life. If anyone desires, anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. But then secondly, Jesus says, and let him take up his cross daily. Take up his cross daily. Now what does that mean? Well, taking up the cross is a symbol for embracing the reproach and conflict and even sometimes persecution that comes with being a true Christian. From the very beginning, Jesus is honest with us that there is a cross to be born if you're going to follow him. That's not easy. There will be conflict, ongoing conflict with the world, your own flesh, and the devil. And it's a daily conflict and it never ends until our dying day. And if we desire to come after him, we need to be aware of that, Jesus. We need to accept that. We need to be prepared by his grace and with his help to take up the cross daily. Now, I want you to think about how these words must have struck the disciples at that time. Now, we can easily miss the force of what Jesus is saying here. But remember, Jesus himself hasn't died on the cross yet. Okay? Okay? He's never said anything to them about the fact that he's going to die on a cross. He's never said that. He t he's just told them just before this that he's going to suffer and die, but he's never said anything about dying on a cross, okay? The disciples at this point have no idea that this will be the method by which Jesus will die. Because we live on this side of Christ's death on the cross, we can tend to view the cross only as a symbol of all that Christ has done for us or as a common sin symbol for the Christian faith. But this is long before the cross became a symbol for Christianity on the top of a church steeple or on a necklace that someone wears around their neck. No, when the disciples heard Jesus speak of taking up the cross, it must have been shocking to them. Just less than a hundred years before Christ, King Alexander Janius had crucified 800 Jews in Jerusalem. Around the time of Jesus' birth, the Roman proconsul Verus crucified 2,000 Jews in Jerusalem. And it was an excruciatingly drawn out and painful form of torture and death. And it was the common form of execution by the Roman occupiers in Palestine at the time. Probably all of our Lord's disciples at one time or another had seen someone dragging his cross to the place of execution. So when Jesus spoke of taking up your cross, it was like saying, take up the chopping block or take up your electric chair. And be prepared to suffer, or perhaps even to die. Now, we often use this language of cross-bearing to talk about the little annoyances 
that we meet up with in life. When people complain about their problems, they often say, oh, well, I guess that's just my cross to bear. My mother-in-law is my, by the way, my mother-in-law is not a cross. <laughs> She's wonderful, but, but this kind of thing you hear people say, my mother-in-law is my cross, or my boss is my cross, or my leaky faucet, or whatever it might be. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about those hardships and difficult circumstances and trials and sufferings that come to us specifically because of our devotion to Jesus Christ. If we follow Christ, there will be conflict. There will be pain. There will be times when following Christ wherever he leads us and seeking first his kingdom will separate us from friends and family. It may take us to places that we would have never naturally desired to go. It may expose you to homesickness, loneliness, misunderstanding. And Jesus is acknowledging here that you will keenly feel the pain of these things. It's not because you're a Christian you don't feel it. No, the pain doesn't always go away. It's bearing a cross, not a cushion. Also, you're not, to be, you're not going to be popular with everyone. Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 18 and following, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were not of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the words that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. For 20 centuries, totalitarian regimes and false religious establishments have told Christians that they must either conform to their demands or die. And we may be tempted to think it doesn't happen anymore because of the religious freedom that we enjoy in America. But if you actually look at the statistics, this has never been more the case now at this present time in the world. Severe persecution of Christians, especially found in Muslim countries, also in China, in Vietnam, in portions of India. In many countries today, God's people are languishing in prisons, are restricted to the most lowly and menial task in society, and some suffer under cruel tortures and die very horrifying deaths because of their faithfulness to Jesus Christ. This is going on in our world today. Now, we who are living here in America, we're not experiencing that kind of persecution right now, but I'm convinced, and if you know anything about what's happening in our country and the direction our country has been taking, taking, taking now, at breakneck speed, you'd be convinced too that even in our country, it's going to become increasingly costly to be a Christian, a true Christian, to, to be a, some, a follower of Jesus Christ. It's going to be costly. It's going to be costly for our children, for these young people here. For all of us, it will be to some degree, even as it is now in our country, where we are relatively free from the most severe forms of persecution, still the words of the Puritan Samuel Rutherford will be true to the experience of every true child of God. You will not get leave to steal quietly to heaven in Christ's company without a conflict and a cross. It may not be prison or torture or death, but there are verbal insults being falsely accused and slandered, lies being told about you to discredit you, problems on the job because you won't do the things the boss is asking you to do because they're immoral and they're wrong and you're devoted to Jesus Christ. You're not going to do them. and It's going to cost you. Men saying all manner of evil against you for Christ's sake. Paul speaks in Philippians 1.28 of having adversaries, the sensing that you have adversaries, certain people who don't like you, people who set themselves against you or even despise you when all you have ever tried to do is to love them and to be faithful to their soul. But they hate you because of it. There's rejection, 
realizing that certain people are talking about you behind your back, that uncomfortable feeling that your presence isn't wanted and you don't fit in. Faithfulness to Christ sometimes results in people turning against you and growing cold toward you that you thought loved you and were your friends, even your own family members. There's being ostracized and cut off from the in crowd at school or at the college or on the job. And we could go on and on because there's hardly an end to the various ways the cross will come to the child of God. It doesn't necessarily come to every Christian in exactly the same way. That's why Jesus said, let him take up his cross. But Jesus is telling us from the very outset that as long as this sinful world is what it is and Satan is who he is, if we would come after him, we must be willing to take up the cross. And to take up the cross daily, it doesn't get easier. It's not just a one-time thing. It's not just making an emotional decision and an altar call under some high-pressured invitation. It leads to a lifetime. It's a daily posture, a daily conflict. And you need to realize this, Jesus. You need to count the cost if you desire to come after me. And then thirdly, we have the present imperative, follow me. We have the two aorist imperatives, which are speaking of a decisive foundational moment in time, denying of self, taking up the cross. And now we have a present imperative. Keep on following me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. This is the life to which conversion leads and by which it is evidenced. A life of ongoing devotion to Jesus Christ, following Christ. The Christian follows Christ's beliefs. Whatever he believes, I believe. Whatever he teaches, I, I, one, of the, one of the Puritans I was reading, he talked about denying self-wit. And what he meant by that is, you know, what I think doesn't matter, it's what Christ thinks. What I believe is not the issue, it's what Christ says. Denying, I believe what he believes. I'm willing to embrace Everything he says, everything his word says, as I come to understand it more and more. I'm not still trying to make up my mind whether or not to believe the Bible or everything that the Bible says and teaches. It's good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. Right? I follow his answers to all the great questions of life. I follow him in his agenda and in the cause of his gospel in the world. And it is my desire and serious endeavor to obey his every command in everything. That's what it means to follow Christ. I sometimes fail. I'm always conscious of remaining sin warring within me. I have cause to be grieved at myself and to repent every day. But for the true Christian, the question has been settled as to whom I will serve. I'm no longer halting between two opinions. It is my desire and serious endeavor by his grace to follow Christ. No turning back. And so, dear friends, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is the cost of coming to Christ and being saved by Him. But whatever the cost may be, if you're a Christian, you you have a hard time even calling it a cost, don't you? Whatever the cost may be, the gains are so much greater. Remember that quote from William Taylor last week? I love that quote. I want to repeat it again. He said, That which to the eye of the worldling looking from without, seems in the Christian to be self-denial and self-sacrifice, is in the experience of the Christian himself supreme satisfaction with the Lord Jesus Christ. For the believer in Christ, born of the Spirit, the joy and the blessings of knowing Christ and the blessings of salvation far outweigh any cost. And next time we're going to move on. We're going to consider the motives and the reasons Jesus gives for embracing this call to follow him. But as I close, I would just simply remind you again of 
of that definition that was given last week of of gospel self-denial. Gospel self-denial in devotion to Christ grows out of the spirit-given believing expectation and experience of greater pleasure, greater joy, and greater blessing that is gained by doing so. It's denying that which is less to gain that which is greater. By faith, the Christian has been enabled to see that belonging to Jesus Christ and being saved by him and living for his glory and the certain hope of eternal life and the glory of the new heavens and the new earth to come are all much more satisfying and rewarding than living a life of self-righteous, sin-loving, self-protecting, self-rule that in the end leads to eternal hell. And this is the choice that's set before every single one of us sitting in this, this auditorium this morning. As Jesus described it in another place, there is the wide gate which leads to the broad road which leads to hell ultimately. And many there be who go in there at. That's the vast multitudes of people who are going down that broad road that leads to hell. Or, he says, there is the narrow gate that leads to the narrow way and that in the end leads to eternal life. Which will it be for you, my friend? Jesus says in verse 24, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says, losing your life for me is the way to save your life. Now, what's he, what's he saying? What's he, what's he mean by that? He's saying true life, useful life, meaningful life, life as it was meant to be when God first created man. Sins forgiven, peace of conscience, something to live for that's bigger and better and much more satisfying than you're living for your own selfish lusts. And in the end, eternal life in the glory of the new world. Jesus says such life is not found by saving your own self-trusting, sin-sparing, self-governed, self-protecting life. It's found in letting go of it and entrusting your life and your soul entirely to me. You know, it was understanding these things that led Jim Elliott the young martyr missionary to pen those words in his personal journal, journal that many of us have heard. And with this, I'll close. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Well, may God bless his word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you today for your word. And we pray that your word would accomplish its purposes in the hearts of every person gathered here this morning. Lord, we thank you for the clarity, the uncompromising nature of your communications toward to us in the Holy Scripture. Help us to take them to heart and to receive them and to act upon them. And we pray this in Christ's name.